Welcome back. This is not strictly a tutorial. I am going to show you some references for the upper saucer uh, hull so that you can see what it looks like and then the steps that are going to be necessary in order to try and mimic a texture for it uh, for, our, for our USS Enterprise 3D model. I've been dreading getting to this part of the uh, tutorial. Um, texturing is highly individualistic as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and I, uh, I am not great at it. But I will show you a couple of tricks that I do know or a couple of things that I have tried out that seem to work fairly well. But first, let's, let's take a look at what we're trying to emulate. The first thing that we're trying to emulate is, of course, the as stated at the beginning of this tutorial series, I want to try and make a model that looks as, as close as I can get using the plans and references available and, and software, uh, free software, to try and look like the original production USS Enterprise uh, used in the series, uh, the 11-foot model used for filming in the uh, 1960s uh, series. Um, and I also wanted to go over uh, a second point. I've been saying I want to try and make it look like the model, and I do. It's why I've given you some odd choices like the uh, <coughs> the uh, little fasteners that hold the uh, a warp engine semi uh, semi-transparent domes onto the warp engines. <coughs> and it looks like these things could be clear, although I had always seen them depicted as leather straps with uh, snaps, but it looks like they were actually hex screws. Um, and, of course, I gave you the original green uh, planetary sensor domes on top, bottom, and in the back. And that one in the back definitely stayed green throughout the run of the series, but there are two kinds, uh, well, there's probably multiple kinds of versions of accurate that you want to do. Number one, of course, the model went through multiple changes uh, throughout the run. It was different for each of the first two pilots. It was different for the first season. They actually made changes during the run of the first season and during the second season, including some changes uh, right up to the Trouble with Tribbles, which was the last time they used the 11-foot model for filming effects. So it, the 11-foot model itself did not look the same from start to end. So you could pick whatever's your favorite version and stick with that. But there's also, uh, instead of trying to emulate what the model looked like that was being filmed, you can also try and model and texture what you saw on screen. It's literally called screen accurate. Uh, and with screen accurate, you could make the top saucer and lower planetary, I'm sorry, the uh, top sensor dome over the bridge and the lower uh, saucer planetary sensor array, you could make them white uh, because that's what it looked like on the screen. Heck, that's what it looks like in this picture. But uh, one of the other things that I wanted to do is I wanted to see if we were accomplishing uh, my stated goal. Are we starting to make a model that looks vaguely like the 11 foot model in the series. And here's a quick render that I did earlier today. And I think, yeah, you know what? Not, not bad. It, you can see a lot more clearly, uh, the details. And this is, uh, where I am with texturing. This is what I'm going to show you today. This and uh, the neck, because those are about the easiest things to uh, to texture. Let me just real fast run down here. Uh, here, all right. So this I, I, I did this with GIMP, and it's on our tutorial model that I've been showing you how to use. Plus, of course, I've got my lighting in place in the rooms in inside the neck and. Some of the windows are blacked out, just like it was during the production run of the series. But my goal is this. Um, 
Here's one of the renders that I'm probably most proud of. I did this with my with what I call my enterprise, the uh, uh, the one that I had made uh, previous to this tutorial series uh, that I've modified and tweaked and changed over the years and rebuilt certain parts. And there are some things that I'm unhappy with, like the uh, this uh, these gray boxes and the yellow squares are a little too prominent in the uh, back. And I've got more accurate colors now. But other than that, I'm, I'm actually fairly satisfied with this. Um, I've had one or two people uh, state that they thought that it was actually a screenshot, of just a, albeit a very clear screenshot from the original series, which, you yeah, uh, that makes me extraordinarily happy. Um, in any case, this is kind of what we're aiming for, and I figured I'd show you a little bit more uh, history Like here. This is actually slightly clearer, even though it's still not a very clear shot. When the 11-foot model was taken to the uh, uh, Smithsonian, uh, they repainted a lot of the model almost immediately. They had to fix the uh, plastic hemispheres on the front of the warp engines. Uh, I think think that they replaced the uh, glass domes top and bottom of the saucer. The uh, deflector dish in the front of the engineering hull was missing and had been uh, since earlier in the 1970s when, when the model was shown at a school. But having said all of that, the one thing that they left untouched was the top of the saucer. Um, you can actually see that little tiny uh, round, I think it's frosted plastic, just like the three lights here. Of course, this fourth one is painted on. Um, but in that picture that I showed you earlier, this is a screenshot. You can actually see that spot right here. It is not lit. That's for certain. As a matter of fact, it, it looks pretty much like the rest of the hull, except that you can see that there's something around here. Well, there it is. It's a little easier to see here. And the large flashing lights, green and red on the port side, green on the starboard. And the tiny little running lights next to them, you can see, and you can almost make out the little running light that's on the side of the saucer here. Almost. You can see a little better some of the coloring that we're going to do here. There is a rust ring that extends around about a third of the uh, saucer top. It does not extend to the back. However, there are streaks uh, and these brownish areas, especially in the back of the saucer, which I've taken to calling space dirt. Um, you can see them here. There's also green. These darker streaks are green, which I have not yet put uh, in, in our tutorial model yet. You can, we can quibble about the coloring that happens with different types of film and under different lighting conditions, but you can basically see the same thing here. There's the green, blue, gray, uh, I've, I've heard silver thrown in, of the uh, hull up top, and then this sensor grid that extends all over the upper hull. I'm trying to remember if I've told you about that. Gene Roddenberry wanted to show uh, a, a sensor grid. And Matt Jeffrey is the guy who designed the Enterprise. Um, he didn't want external components. Uh, he thought, well, you know, the environment of space is uh, very dangerous. And I would think that an advanced scientific culture would house all of the uh, components that need to be worked on internally. But, of course, that doesn't make for very exciting uh, episodes. You know, it makes for far more exciting if your guy's going to go out on the hull than is menaced by 
menaced by uh, alien fire and, uh, and asteroids and meteorites and such. In any case, uh, there are a couple of things to note. You don't see the grid lines going through this gray area here, and it is ever so much slightly darker than the hull coloring. This could be uh, one of the medium gray accents in any case. Moving on. Another angle where you can see some of this, and yeah, we can kind of disregard this down here. Notice the year was 2000. This is after the 1980s um, restoration. They hired a special effects company that built models for movies to come in and fix up the 11-foot model of the Enterprise. And they completely redid the paint scheme on the rest of the ship. I mean, they held some of the details uh, that were there from the series, but they really hyper-enhanced things like uh, painting on grid panels and so on that were barely visible. Anyway, uh, right, I was telling you about Roddenberry wanting the uh, saucer grid depicted uh, on the uh, show. So what the special effects guys did, because they really didn't want to cha make changes, they came in and they drew this grid on in pencil. Now, <clears throat> with the filming standards of the time and broadcast <clears throat> what it was back then, they knew it would never show up. Well, you can see some of that space dirt back here and in the streaks, green and brown. They knew it would never show up on screen, and at the time, it didn't. Um, but Roddenberry could walk in and see the model, and he could quite clearly see the pencil <clears throat> lines that had been drawn on. Um, so he was happy, and uh, Matt Jeffries was happy because he didn't have you know more external details to explain. Here there are two uh, these interesting L-shaped boxes on either side of the linear accelerator, and two squares of red. For the longest time, I thought there was <clears throat> I'm sorry, yellow. Uh, I, uh, I'm getting to that point. Uh, for the longest time, I thought that there was a tiny little red outline around them, but I, I don't think that there is. What there is an outline around, kind of, are the letters and numbers, the characters, because they used, of course, decals. And you can actually see some of the flash around the decal here of this yellow box. Um and it turns out that over time, under the lights, uh, under the studio lights when they were filming, the edge of those decals would kind of go a little gold. Um, it was, I think it was basically that it was yellowing. Uh, and of course, they were slightly shiny. So, and, and they had two kinds, of course. There was the normal, and then there was, uh, they had them also reversed. So that when they would slap those uh, decals on and film it, then they could flip the film and make it appear as if you were seeing the port side of the ship. Because notice the model, since they only ever expected to see it from, you know, an angulation, never, hardly ever. I mean, once or twice did they film it straight on. But they intended for you to see that there were a couple of details that were the same as over here and your mind would fill in the rest because you didn't see the rest, right? You weren't, uh, you weren't ever really filming from the port side of the model. So you were meant to assume that port and starboard were mirror images. This I've included because this is again, when the model was delivered to the uh, <clears throat> Smithsonian originally and they took it apart to try and clean it up and replace some missing pieces. But you can see the saucer top. I mean, it's got that blue, green, gray, uh, semi-gloss. Uh, well, actually, they called it a satin finish. Uh, you can see some of the space dirt on the back of the uh, rounded portion uh, of the hull. You can see space dirt streaks green and uh, brown. This rust ring that starts here goes around and ends here. Um, actually, right there. 
Uh, and then you can barely see the two yellow boxes and these strange L-shaped uh, items, and of course the painted on light. <laughs> Um, I watched the uh, series my whole life, and it wasn't until, I don't know, sometime in the 1980s when I became aware that that light was not a light. It was not lit. It was just painted on. Another shot, a little better. Uh, you can see some of the green and brown streaks of uh, space dirt on the leading edge. And you can fairly clearly see the very, very light uh, grid details, which are just a delight for me. And this is pretty much hat on, and you can you can see a couple of the lights on the on the uh, port side of the uh, <coughs> BC deck, and you are meant to assume that it continued around, just like it did on the starboard side, because again they never filmed from the port side, not really. Another shot. I don't know why the guys who do restoration uh, always put play figures on. Maybe it's for scale. Uh, but Gary Kerr does this as well. It makes you wonder if Gary Kerr was visiting when they did the initial uh, restoration of the USS Enterprise so many years ago. Uh, I'm kidding, but he does that too. Here's a little better shot of the dual red lines that run alongside the slightly darker gray section of hull that does not have grid lines in it. And the red box on the back of the BC deck does not extend down to the bottom, and it does not match up. As a matter of fact, this red uh, rectangular area is actually thicker than these red lines. So it's the same coloring, but a different width. Another angle. And you can just see all the dirt and lines that they painted on. And again, none of this stuff was really visible uh, on televisions of the 1960s. Such a shame. And there's, there's even more. Um, even though all these pictures I'm showing you are the same model, they are done with different films, different camera lenses, under different lighting conditions, so the colors look wildly different from shot to shot, and yet it's the same model. And the saucer top, which you can't see here, uh, was left untouched. Now, this is from the 1980s restoration, and they did keep some of the details, like this section on the forward part, on the forward uh, end of the neck, really was differently colored during the production run than the rest of the neck. Yes, there was some space dirt and so on. But this front, this leading edge was blue. And as a matter of fact, in the original pilot, if you ever take a look at that, oh, I knew I should have gotten that, a uh, shot of the Enterprise would show that the entire neck was blue. I was kind of surprised that they went with that because um, I would have expected that to uh, wreak havoc with the... Uh, with the blue screen that they used. Anyway, uh, another shot in the Smithsonian before they did the modern restoration shows you that leading edge, and they made it kind of greenish. It was actually blue. Let's see what I can do here. Yeah, now, this is an old shot from when they were filming Space Seed, obviously. Here's the Botany Bay. And you can see some of that brown space dirt and the rust ring that's uh, on the engineering deck. And the model is lit. This is actually a very nice shot. But here, what you might assume is shadow, but it's not because this section here is lit all the way through. This is blue. Luckily, it's a slightly different hue than the blue screen, but uh, it's definitely a different color. see what else can I do oh yeah here this now this is from uh, I think this is from when they were shooting where no man has gone before I think I'm not yeah 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 of course of course you know silly me 
Now, not all the ports are there that we're used to. The bridge is much larger. Uh, there are more windows on the neck, but, but take a look at the neck. Uh, even though it's got some decent lighting, it just looks darker than the rest of the ship. Now, some of that's due to geometry and lighting and so on, yes. But look at the color. The color is blue. Uh, this whole area was blue, and you can actually see it in really clear screen captures uh, from both Where No Man Has Gone Before and also from, uh, oh, the first episode that they filmed, which was The Corbo Might Maneuver. Um, and you can clearly see at one point, you can see the color of the neck, which was blue. So if you're doing a, a Where No Man Has Gone Before uh, Enterprise, you're going to want to omit the washboard section here on the forward arm of the engineering hall. You're going to want some space dirt, but it's nowhere near as pronounced as during the run of the rest of the series, or at least on the screen, it was nowhere near as pronounced there is no phaser nipple on the lower planetary sensor array, and the bridge is, of course, much larger with extra details on it. The warp engines are not lit, and they have spikes on them that look like, uh, you know, gold turrets for electronics that, uh, for anybody old enough, uh, you might remember seeing stuff like that in Radio Shack uh, many years ago. Uh, okay, so here's another shot from shooting space seed and you can again you can clearly see that demarcation there that uh, area where the leading edge of the enterprise was blue nineteen eighties another shot very clear showing you all the space dirt and such on the original I know I've got others it's starting to... Oh, here. Mike and Denise Okuda. Um, Long-time Star Trek fans will probably know them, especially from Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine. Here is a close-up of that round port up front, which some people insist on lighting, but... To my knowledge, it was never lit during the run of the original series. You can also see that this was drawn on with a pencil, probably a mechanical pencil. And they even missed a spot here. They started to do some, uh, they started to draw a little bit and then they went and realigned and redrew. And you'll notice it's not perfectly centered. Believe it or not, they, when, if you continue this line, it does not go through the middle of the forward, uh, of the centermost round uh, port. Oh, okay. Like here. You can see that the center line is actually cutting through, uh, you know, it's off center through that center port, which is, you know, it was a model. It was made for filming. That's Gary Kerr. That's the guy who uh, has the most accurate measurements on this 11 foot model he's he's been to it and measured it twice he works uh, in conjunction with the uh, petri bloomquist um and here's another shot a little clearer of gary even though gary is in motion here a little blurry you can see that they replaced the christmas tree lights with leds they'll be longer lasting and they hope they don't have to work on them as much um and this is what the enterprise looks now looks like now uh post uh, 2017 restoration and you can see that they tried to get the painting style back to the way it was in 1964 I think no wait a minute that's that's not right 1964 is when it was broadcast so 1965 was uh, I think the filming of the second season and that was the last time changes were applied to this model. Um, they've gone a little beyond it, of course. They've got the wiring now internalized. If you wanted to, you could go ahead and you could detail the port side, which they have not. Um, they've tried to paint the rust ring back on, uh, on the engineering, all similar to how it was. Although they threw rust on the forward end of this arm, which I don't believe I ever saw during the run of the series. They've got the tiny little phaser nipple in place, which you only ever saw in maybe two shots. I mean, 
again, resolution was not what it is today. Uh, they didn't have high def. It was approximately 640 by 480 uh, uh, dots. Here's a nice shot that uh, Gary made, and you can actually see some of the, uh, well, I call it silvering uh, from building models, but there's this little outline around the numbers, and that's that edge of the decal that looks uh, gold sometimes. Really clear shot of the bridge prior uh, to the current restoration, and you can see what uh, you can see the pencil lines on the hull and the painting. And remember, the hull, the top of the saucer, was pretty much left alone during all the uh, various efforts on uh, restoration. All right, and let's, let's say that we're almost done here. Um, this shot of the neck, you can see, now this is before the current restoration. This was what the 1980s restoration team did. They actually made a difference on the back as well and the front. The front is certainly accurate. Uh, I don't believe the back is. All right, and we'll wrap it up. When we, uh, when we come back, the, we'll start on the tutorial proper on how to use GIMP to try and emulate some of all of this uh, all of this texture detail texturing is what can really make or break a model uh, and again I'm not an expert but I will show you a few tricks that either uh, I've copied from somebody or from tinkering around in blender I figured out myself uh, and uh, I hope you find them useful see you in the tutorial